<laughs> Sorry, gents and uh, ladies, uh, about this. We've um, this is the first time I actually run Taking Stock live, so um, it's obviously a bit of an experiment for me. So we'll get better, but um, welcome everyone anyway. And uh, you know, I'm delighted today to be able to host this uh, live hot stock show with um, accomplished investor and um, sort of like uh, ex fund manager Graham Neri of uh, of Stockopedia. So welcome, uh, Graham. It's a pleasure, Paul. Um, lovely to be speaking with you again so soon after our last little chat. Yeah, well, that was a bit embarrassing for me just a moment ago, but <laughs> I'm used to being embarrassed. But uh, anyway, uh, we've had quite a lot of really important macro data over the last two weeks, not least the sort of the big um, CPI prints on both sides of the Atlantic uh, on uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Plus, we found out we were in the UK in a technical recession alongside uh, on Japan yesterday. Um, but before we sort of dig into the details of that, um, can you just briefly sort of talk about what type of investor sort of Graham Airy is and what type of stocks you like? Yeah, sure. Look, I'll say very briefly, I, li I like uh, cheap stocks. I like high quality stocks. I study companies qualitatively, but with an eye for value. Uh, so I tend to be very selective in what I pick. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate companies with good culture, uh, companies with a, with a good long history as well, often, and uh, owner management and all that sort of good stuff. Yeah. What, what about yourself? Uh, well, yeah, I'm I'm fairly simple. I mean, I I haven't had a sort of classic sort of you know sort of fund manager training like yourself. I was sort of like in corporate uh, in fine corporate finance with um, GKN doing M and A, and also with Unilever before that doing sort of commercial. So I'm a I'm a trained accountant by trade, and actually it was just by coincidence one of your colleagues. I started professionally investing at the same time as Paul Scott back in in 2003. So I've been running my own money for for, for 20 years. So. Uh, it's mine is sort of like uh, a bit of sort of trial and error and um, sort of experience. But uh, I look for sort of GARP stocks typically, and my sort of like uh, sweet spots are in um, in software, recurring revenue streams, and um, and healthcare. But I do like industrials as well if they've got good sort of like you know tailwinds behind them. So I tend to go for companies in four areas. First of all, is the company good, which is obviously all what you've talked about in terms of good management team, quality IPR. And then I look for the industry. Is there a secular tailwind uh, involved in that? Then I see, the, which is always the hard bit, I, the place I always start is management because I always, you know, not always, but that's where my, my biggest errors have been, thinking that management are good and then it's dropped off. And then once you've done those first three key issues, what the valuation, what the price versus valuation equation is, and uh, and if it's positive, then I'll push the button and usually go in quite heavy if I can, if I can get liquidity. But before we sort of get, get into that macro, what, what, who who was the fund manager? Who, did, who Which shop did you did you learn the sort of ropes on when you were a fund manager? Who did you work for there, Graham? Oh, I spent about four or five years with a with a Canadian insurance company. Um, it's it's known as uh, the, well, it was originally the Forrester Friendly Society, and it's kind of rebranded over the years. But uh, you know, it's 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 very big in uh, in Canada, the United States, and it's de decent size in, U in the UK as well. Um, so we had uh, I think it was one point six billion pounds under direct management at the time it, with the investment wow. team in the UK. Um, now about about three fifths of that was was fixed income, the rest of it was equities, and um, we uh, yeah we ran it ourselves, and that was my that was my training. Um, I did my CFA exams at the time, and uh, that uh, and then sort of I sort of segued straight from that into being a talking head. Uh, so. <laughs> Well, you do that very well. There's no doubt about yeah. it. But uh, I want to learn a shed load on this uh, on these hot stocks and hopefully on a few ones before. Oh, sorry, we're going after as well. So let's move on to the sort of the macro. And um, as I mentioned, we've got quite a few sort of we've had quite a lot of good sort of data points. Um, let me just go on to the relevant uh, screen share. Uh, where is it? Oh, crikey. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, yeah. What just what what's your sort of view? Have we sort of slain the inflation dragon, and what does that mean for um, for sort of GDP on on both sides at the um, the Atlantic? Yeah, I mean this uh, this technical recession thing is. Um, I mean, it's obviously a real problem. Um, nobody wants to see 
GDP falling, but it's it's only 0.3 percent or 0.1 percent. It's not like it's not like the COVID situation. It's not like uh, the GFC. Um, you know, if if GDP starts rising again, I don't think anybody will remember this as being a particularly you know terrible uh, time for for the economy. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, employment is is almost more interesting and more important than um than gdp you know we've yeah. got the unemployment situation is is pretty the employment situation is pretty good i'd say uh effectively full employment in my opinion and yeah. um what's well, what's been quite interesting there actually as I, as i noticed is that when when you if you look at the sort of the debt burden most of the debt of the pandemic and this is the government debt. Most of the debt of the, pa- of the from the pandemic, but, but also sort of investment, et cetera, has been borne by governments. And so if you look at the sort of the percentage of debt to GDP and, and what that means then, as you rightly say, for, for the consumer, is actually their balance sheets are in pretty good shape, aren't they? Even though everybody's sort of scared about sort of like losing the credit. But because even the consumer is 70 percent of the economy. All their debt has moved on to to the government's ba- bag. Yeah, I, I mean the uh, debt to GDP situation. I think it's about a hundred percent in the UK, roughly. Yeah. Um, so it's you know, it's not ideal, um, but you know if it stayed around there, um, you know, especially given that a lot of it is so long term debt compared to America, it's it seems manageable. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's. For me, it's a very mixed picture economically. I, you know, I do understand there is a cost yeah. of living crisis. We, you know, so many companies have talked about that over the past year. Um, it is, it is, it has been difficult to for households to keep pace with inflation. But mm. at four percent, and with a lot of upward pressure on wages, um, maybe the situation is not that bad. I mean, if you yeah. if you talk to the Bank of England, they they probably don't like the fact that wages seem to be rising, uh, you know, quickly, you know, more fa- mm. faster than they wanted it to. But, um, you know, from a household point of view, it can't be such a bad thing. Um, kind yeah, of no, I, I would, I, I would agree. Yeah, no, I, I think certainly with the with inflation, it may not be coming down quite as fast as people want. But if you look at the sort of the charts of the UK, the eurozone, and the US here, they're both coming down from from peaks. Inflation expectations on five year, five year are pr- still pretty reasonable. And you, as you absolutely rightly point out, real positive wage growth in people's pockets. And as long as the employment situation stabilizes, or you know, doesn't 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 deteriorate significantly, then they should be able to fund. You know, and I think what we're seeing is, I don't know if you'd agree with this. I think what we're seeing is a, a normalization of consumer spend rather that after the surge sort of like you know revenge spending of everybody going abroad and the, all the goods while we were locked down it's normalization rather than a cracking of the consumer i mean is, is, does that make sense yeah I, I i think so i mean the main point really is that we have had an, an overall normalization with, with you know with interest rates going back to five percent plus uh, from ZERP, you know, we had mm. we had this terrible artificial situation for so long, and I'm amazed that the economy has has come come through uh, rates normalizing. And yes, it is tough for a lot of people, but it, you know, it's we're sort of getting through it in a much better way than I would have expected and and even hoped for. So. Um, yeah, with five percent interest rates, we're um, we've got a healthy situation for pension funds. Savers are are a lot healthier. Uh, you know, the banks can. You know, it, I know bank valuations are very low, but you know, long term banks should be happier with a five percent base rate than zero. So, uh, for me, it's a it's a healthy normalization of the economy that we've seen, and. Mm-hmm. Um, Obviously, there's there's uh, hiccups along the way, but uh, overall, it seems to be going pretty well. Would you agree? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I mean, what's again surprised me? Not only the interest rates have rocketed, 
and we haven't seen a deterioration. But likewise, we've had an inverted yield curve for almost two years. And that hasn't, you know, that's supposed to be sort of the, the number one slam dunk indicator we're heading to recession. In fact, I think it was only 12 months ago that all the sort of the uh, the, the experts, the capital markets experts, 100% of them were saying we're going to get a recession. And actually, what was it last quarter, we got 5% at growth in the uh, in the US or 5% in, in Q3 and 3% in, in, Q, in Q4. So that we, we've been so far and away, you know, sort of like, you know, wrong on that. Um, okay, good. In terms of sort of like for central banks, I mean, the moment, obviously, at the end of last year, everybody was sort of predicting that we're going to see six to seven rate cuts in the US and, and similar in the UK. And now, as for just from this one, we've had the bond yield curve picking up over the last month, which has obviously been a bit of a lead weight on equities, particularly UK ones, small caps. You, what, what's your sort of like view on on central banks going forward? Because we do seem to be getting a bit of a divergence with GDP. We've got the UK and Europe in a sort of tem- uh, technical recession, but normalisation. But we've still got the US going gangbuster on the back of all of that fiscal spend. Um, mm. which, so we may get different timings for different rate cuts. What's your sort of view on that with central banks? Because that's a key driver of equity returns. Yeah, I mean, I don't claim to be an expert on central banks, but uh, I do think America, the United States is incredible that they um, they show such discipline. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, sort of look, criticized the, um, the United States for its, um, you know, for its wasteful spending over the years um, and its, you know, its debt burden and so on. But then when push came to shove, they raised interest rates um more aggressively than pretty much everyone else um they're still they've still got a higher interest rate than the bank of england higher than the higher than the ecb um and they've got faster gdp growth so it sort of seems like everybody's every they're winning mm. from every perspective no matter which way you look at it um pensioners and savers are, have done well the the stock market's boomed um the unemployment rate is even is even lower than, yeah. than the UK, uh, not by much. But just the point is that on every metric, uh, they they've just done incredibly well. So uh, I, I don't know what you can do except uh, tip your hat to them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in terms of timings for for central bank, you know, um, interest rate reductions, it looks though, and I agree with you. You've got to tip your hat to the US and uh, they probably don't need to reduce interest rates as fast as maybe the Bank of England. So if, if, if it comes as a stop picking, if you're looking at interest rate sensitive areas, your house builders, your building stocks, autos and all this sort of stuff, then they're probably looking at you know an era term turnaround and recovery in the UK and Europe than the US, I'm guessing. And that's not yet been priced into the market because as you can see here, we've got expectations of central bank cuts and basically it's got almost like in unison even after the latest moves for the uk and the us and the U- and eurozone is going down by a similar amount so uh okay good yeah, well interesting. yeah so in terms of in terms of sort of we've just come through the us corporate season you know reporting season is there any sort of key takeaways that you've seen in terms of because we've had meta we had meta blowing the the socks off earnings and that was up 20 percent on the day We've got Nvidia next week, and we've had every single. I mean, one one try. Every single tech stock has been shedding headcounts. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Uh, I don't spend a huge amount of time studying them, but I do own. Um, I mean, I do own Berkshire Hathaway. I know I own Alphabet as well in my personal portfolio. Um, I've also been a long term skeptic of Tesla. Uh, which people will know from my Twitter account, etc. You were short it at one stage, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a, that was potentially a dangerous move. Well, I got out of there. You know, uh, that's yeah. the thing when you're, you know, when you're shorting, you got to you got to get out of it in time. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know, and so through Berkshire Hathaway, I do own Apple. Um. And then I suppose the what does concern me is when I look at the um you know, the rise of the passive market uh, mm. the passive investors. And then you see that people are piling into NVIDIA at these, um, at these valuations. Um, it's actually, it's kind of a little bit scary when you see how much passive money is going into NVIDIA and even Tesla at this level. Yeah. Um, 
you know, the Magnificent Seven, as they're called. But I think, obviously, the Magnificent Seven includes some magnificent companies, but um, <laughs> it wouldn't take much to sort of knock them over and uh, really deal a huge blow to passive investors. So um, I, I do worry about, about that, the vulnerability of the, the US market from that point of view. Yeah, you raised two really good points. First, on valuation of the sort of the Mag Seven. I mean, I I, I saw uh, Nvidia, I think, trades over about uh, over twenty times sales at the moment, and I know the earnings is is about forty forty five times, but it's just ridiculous margins. It's sort of like unsustainable margins and probably unsustainable price to sales. But actually, after the recent surge in ARM, the UK technology company which listed Nasdaq. After that recent surge in results, it's on thirty-five times sales, which just seems—I mean, that's 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 straight out of the dot-com boom, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's crazy valuation. All you, all you know is that it's a great company with great technology, but it's probably in the price when it gets to that level. Yeah, I mean, it's—I uh, I don't understand it. I, I don't claim to understand it. Yeah. People talk about our artificial intelligence and mm. so on, but I, I don't get it. Yeah. And then just on that other point you've raised with regards to passive investing, I mean, you've got um, more than 50 percent of the U.S. market now. But the money is run through passives, which is basically follow somebody else buying, buy more of it if it goes up and sell, sell more if it goes down. It just seems totally lopsided, certainly when it comes to price discovery. Do you, what do you think? I mean, obviously, there's a place in the market for people who just want to sleep at soundly at night and just want to track the market. But it does get to a stage whereby it, it actually presumably puts a sort of like a, you know, a risk underneath the market because things can unwind very quickly. I, I don't know if you're um, if you're familiar with David Einhorn of Greenlight Capital. He's he's one of my uh, investing heroes um, because he uh, he has some brilliant short theses over the years um, and he's a value investor. Um, but he's recently been uh, quoted and it's almost it's kind of hilariously sad in a way because he's saying that um, he, he can't invest the way he used to because it used to be the case that you'd, you'd you'd make an earnings forecast for a small company and then it would beat forecasts and then the price would go up and he'd, he'd make a return. But he's saying that actually there's nobody watching these companies anymore. He's saying there's <laughs> the, the active investors have left. And, and so now he, he makes these forecasts and he might be right, but it actually won't, it won't make a difference to the share prices anymore because there's nobody correcting the prices of these companies anymore. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it speaks to an opportunity for, you know, for long-term investors, mm -hmm. but I, I thought it was interesting because you asked me that question the other day about, you know, the small companies not really moving much when you think yeah. they should be moving and that's an example of a very experienced, a brilliant investor in America who's basically saying the same thing. I'm saying I've given up, you know, expecting a return over over a two year time period if I get my estimates right, because everybody's passive now. Nobody's going to correct pricing anom anom anomalies for me anymore. Yeah, I, I, you've raised an absolutely fabulous point there, because once you lose price discovery, i.e. what the correct price is and, and price and value become effectively un, you know you get you end up getting an inefficient market that's what we're effectively saying but not only in the small caps but also in the large caps as well and just you're right if you're a very good stock picker then there's opportunity and here's on the valuation metrics i mean you can see nasdaq 100 on about 27 times you've got the s&p on about 21 times and the uk small cap on on 12 now what that doesn't do is actually overlay the growth profile of the earnings but when you do that you then get the peg ratios, and it's even more extreme. And I think, you know, we, we certainly where your sort of sweet spot is with 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 uh, Stockopedia, it's down here. And if you've got a peg ratio of less than one, it's usually good value. But at 0.7, it, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk on that one at all. You, you, we, we're going to go through some opportunities at the moment, but presumably you're seeing some some quite good opportunities. Yeah, I suppose the the risk there, as you know yourself, Paul, is that you know if you're fishing in aim. Uh, you know, you're going to get some boot, you know, some old boots, and you're going to get yeah. some tin cans, and you're get, you're going to get things you don't want there yeah. when you're fishing in that market. So, um, uh, you know, you can just got to be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we that's why we subscribe to you and Paul. You see, so you can uh, you can hand you can hold our hands through all this. 
Okay, good. Well, let's move to some stocks of the sort of the last two weeks. We've got one of you um, uh, talked about was Water Intelligence yesterday, which came out with a trading update, and this one does sort of leak detection. Fra- a bit of a mixed model. It's sort of franchised largely out in the states, but also owns some of the franchisees, and also has a water sort of prevention stroke, you know, leak detection. But uh, also, it helps utilities do sewage management in the U- in the UK. Um, came out with an inline trading update. Do you want to take us through you, you, your view on this one? Because I just know a bit about it because I own it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I imagine you probably know know more about it than I do, Paul. Um, but um, from what attracted me to it was the franchise model. Again, we spoke about that the other day. Um, a little bit complicated, the fact that they're buying back franchises yeah. um, kind of does raise a question mark about you know, how good, how well is the franchise model working if they're having to buy them back? But, you know, you could argue that it is that it is a cost of running the model that occasionally franchisees won't be successful and you'll have to come in and, and fix the situation for them. Um, so they've been buying back a few franchises um, across the United States. Um, overall, I've, I've gone positive on this one. Um, Bit of a close call for me, but valuation has come off uh, quite a lot. If you zoom out to like a multi multi year chart, I suppose you've got the multi year chart there. Yeah. Um, so valuations come off a fair bit there, and um, you know, I think the track record is pretty decent. Growth is a bit a little bit low right now in terms of network sales, which is, mm. which is what I look at more than revenue. So network sales being sales to customers, not revenue to the company, which is a yeah, different which thing. went up. A, it was less, didn't go up as much, did it? It was about uh, was it three percent or something? The network sales. Network sales was three percent. So that's that's below U.S. inflation. Well, it's below it's below inflation generally. So um, that's a little bit disappointing. But um, at the same time, pre-tax profit was up thirteen percent, which was you know very mm. good. So. Um, overall, I'm I'm I generally like what I see there, but um, what, what what's your view on it? Yeah, I mean, I this this the reason why I've invested my investment thesis is it's never going to shoot the lights out. But you can tell from the chart and from what it's done in history, it's a it's a serial compounder. So I'd like to hold this for five to ten years, and if I do sort of 15 percent per annum gross return, I, uh, that's absolutely far, fine to me. And it trades on about thirteen times PE for really quite a unique asset. And you've got experienced management team who has got a big skin in the game and are buying shares effectively through their incentive schemes, which is what they you know they do for their bonuses. They, they take shares instead. Then they obviously believe in it and they've got a lot of sort of like, you know, personal um, skin in the game. Um, and uh, But they'll want to retire at some point in time. And I could see somebody, private equity, taking these out at some point. At what price is another question. I mean, you've got you've got sure capital on about I think it's eight hundred p per share. That looks a bit toppy to me. When I do a sort of fifteen to twenty times multiple, I'm getting about five quid, and that's where I would see it. But uh, no, it's it's very much a sort of like, hey, just leave this one, and um, at some point in time, you're going to get some good news. It'll either don't expect it to knock the ball out of the park. It's not going to be a sort of like a plexus or, you know, one of these high, high, high risk, high, high, it's got a solid balance sheet. It's got good customers who like it. And it's in a nice, it's in a very good secular trend industry of, of water prevention. I think. It's probably got a lot in common with uh, franchise brands. Would you say? Yeah, you're probably right. It hasn't got as much debt as franchise bands, but mm-hmm. it's, but yeah, franchise bands is, is that B2B, isn't it? Um, that, uh, it's, that's a nice business and it's good. It's a sort of, that's more of a sort of like a buy and build. Whereas this one, I think the water intelligence really tends to buy sort of its own franchisees or bring or buy in specific technology that it can then leverage over its, um, its base. So, um, good. Yeah, okay. I, I do agree with you. It was over. I do think it was overpriced before, but it's probably come back to a decent, decent yeah. level here. Yeah. One the one the thing I just would be, you know, like just just to mention here is that I have actually just bought, um, topped up my position. I, I've been talking about it for quite some time in in another controversial sort of like um, company called Argentex, oh, yeah. and um, it basically is a international pay, forex payments company, and it's been through the mill as you can see on its share price. Okay, 
So I think it listed at about a pound or something took about three or four years ago, and it's come down now to below 60p. And I, I, I know a lot about this particular area. It, it's trades at about sort of six to seven times P, masses of cash, et cetera. And it's USP is that it does a sort of like um, white glove type of service for in um, high net worth investors and B2B um, well, businesses and also for fun, for funds, et cetera. And it's had a management bust up, essentially. New interim has gone in there, plus they've had a new chairman. And um, they're sort of like doing a strategic views to turn the, the business round. What sort of piqued my interest, particularly last week, is that the old CEO, and I don't know, this is, this is my speculation because it hasn't been a, hasn't been a TR run where we're doing it funding. The old CRO, Harry Adams, has actually offloaded a big chunk of shares who has then fallen into the kind lap of Richard Staveley, who's a bit of a rock star, sort of like, you know, fund manager with, um, with Rockwood Strategic. And he's bought about four or five percent of the company. Anyway, so I followed in him last week, which meant I had to sell a couple of things. But uh, I thought I'd just let people know because I know you've done, you've also in the past done a an analysis of that. And it, it, the thing is, you've got to get your head around: is it cheap for a reason, or is it cheap and there's a turnaround? I don't, I don't know if you've, mm. you're familiar with this or whether you've uh, you've had a look at it, but um, it's certainly pretty cheap. I, I have had a little look at this one. Um... There probably must. I, I presume there's still an overhang if if Harry Adams sold four percent. Yes, yes. There's still so going to be that overhang left. That is an excellent question because um, he hasn't disclosed his TR one, so he's probably working the order. Um, and if there is an overhang, then I think more people will start getting on board. And and if it and once he's out, and it might be painful in the short term. Once he's out, then um, you'll see a significant re-rating. But yeah, you do raise a good point there. He's got he did have about fifteen million shares. I think he's probably sold about four or five. I mean, I would worry about a sort of loss of direction, possibly. I mm. mean, th- with all the founders, I mean, are, I think all the founders are gone now, possibly. After, yes, they are. Yeah, both him. both founders are out of the business. Yeah. Yes, I ju- I just wonder does it would it would it. You know, I, I would see them as being very essential to sort of strategy and vision. Mm. And I, I wonder, I'd like to know if the if the new, they have an interim CEO, I believe. Yeah, um, so Jim they're gonna, They're going to need a permanent CEO and then you'd want to hear something about what the, the vision is long term. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you make me more excited, to be honest, actually, because... <laughs> When somebody puts a strategic review and your sort of questions, I'd like to know more and a bit strategic direction. What does that say to me? That say, that says to me, if anybody's interested in buying this business from an external, you might well see the strategic view isn't redo all the strategy. It's actually what we've done is put a for sale sign over the top of the castle. And uh, if somebody wants to have a good look at us, then we are available for a chat. But we're not actively we're not actively soliciting the business. But if people want to go and have a go and go and kick the tires on it on a very cheap valuation with synergistics, then uh, and in a consolidating industry, I don't know. I'll probably look in. I'm probably look reading between the lines, but uh, we'll wait and see. Okay, well, let's move on to a, even more cheaper stock, which I'm surprised you haven't actually bought. Is um, is one you covered yesterday, which is Jarvis. Not sorry, Jarvis. It's new Close Brothers because it had a bit of a shocker. It came down like thirty percent yesterday on the back of um, some um, FCA commissions. But uh, I think it's super cheap now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I always thought that Coast Brothers was a very um, respectable, you know, long-standing <laughs> financial institution, you know, worthy of respect. But the market is giving it no respect now, none, none whatsoever. Um, and I'm astonished. You know, I, I looked at this company a couple of years ago when it was probably – trading over 10 pounds a share. And I thought, yeah, it looks okay here. It looks nice. It looks like a nice business. And that, now we're below three pounds. Um, so I think probably, uh, uh, now this might be a little bit optimistic, but I'm imagining that a lot of the sellers are just people who want dividends and who mm. who are upset that the dividend is, is been, has been suspended. Um, personally, I, I don't have a problem with Close Brothers suspending its dividend in the circumstances. Uh, I'm not really a dividend investor anyway, so it doesn't wouldn't wouldn't really uh, bother me. But um, they they were trading on a, on a yield 
that looked unsustainable mm. and and that it's turned out that in fact it was unsustainable from you know from the point of view of the company i suppose the yield was 15% or 17% or something and now it's gone straight to zero zero yeah uh, because they're saying that there's a there's an unquantifiable loss or penalty that they could be facing there may there may be there i mean who knows what it could be it could be zero but they 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 are facing some kind of impact from the uh, the motor finance review uh, and, just on know. quantification i mean i'm just looking here just doing the maths okay from eight pounds down to three pounds and then you look at the number of shares it's 150 million shares so that's five times 150 million, which is 750 million of market cap destroyed. What what type of what type of litigation? I mean, it just seems that's so so extreme because I've seen estimates of this whole you know motor finance problem in the press, and yes, it could be potentially put out as the PPI. But the worst case apparently is Lloyd's, which has got about 1.3. But are we really saying? That Close Brothers has got an exposure of about seven hundred million market cap, which is the which would be what which would warrant that fall. I mean, it just seems I don't know how many fleets of cars have they got out there. I don't know. And I mean, it was another one hundred and fifty million pounds of market cap lost yesterday. Yeah, just from saying that they were going to keep money in the business instead of paying it to shareholders. Yeah. I mean, there was, there wasn't really anything else in the update. I, I mean, they acknowledged that they could face a, a loss, but it, mm. I, I thought everybody, everybody would have assumed that. Everybody knew that already. So, yeah, uh, you know, price to book here is obviously, um, you know, very low. I think, I think their tangible book value was one point three billion, roughly. Yeah. Um, so market cap now less than less than half a billion. Um, they, I mean, the leverage. Um, I mean, they are more leveraged than other financial stocks that mm. I take an interest in. But if you look at their capital ratios, like you know, which they publish like any other bank, all, all those ratios are at you know levels which look healthy. Um, so I mean, famous last words here about when you when you think a bank <laughs> is safe or a bank is a good investment. I wouldn't be betting the house on this one by any means, but yeah. um on a risk to reward basis for a small bet yeah. um, has to be worth a look. Yeah, I would. I mean, I think the net tangible assets is around about 650, 50 peep. So it's, you know, it's less than half of that. And also there's, I mean, there's a good, good saying, saying in the city, which you probably know better than I, you know, buy on the sound of cannons, isn't it? And this is the biggest cannon that's been blown out there. It just seems I mean, hey, you know, you and I, when you look at do, when you do a desktop review, you, you just scratch the heads and say, this must be value here. But uh, we both lived through the great financial crisis, didn't we? So <laughs> when we had when we had when we had RBS going to almost zero and uh, lots of other uh, businesses, you've got to, you know, banks can always go lower, can't they? I mean, here's another way to look at it, Paul. Uh, they just in their in their update yesterday, they said that in H1, the period which has just ended in January, they expect to report adjusted operating profits of 94 million pounds. So even if they were fined 100 million pounds by the FCA, uh, if they yeah. can convert their adjusted operating profit into cash, um, okay, they'll have to pay tax on that. But you can see that they, they can sort of potentially pay fines out of their profits as well. Yeah. In a, in a worst case scenario, I, maybe this is too optimistic, but I, I find it does seem to be priced for for Armageddon. Yeah, I would agree. Okay, good. Well, let's move on to another one, which is a bit more sort of higher higher risk, smaller company, which um, came out with news, which is Cornerstone FX, and this is again an international um, payments firm, and they came out with uh, news this last week, which was basically saying that it got approval to expand out into uh, to Canada. It got a, a regulatory license. It's got a sort of, it does it, again, it does sort of like white glove Forex payments um, services to businesses and to high net worth individuals. What's really interesting here to me is, you know, it's still, it's, the shares have gone up, you know, quite a lot. Um, over the last year or so, as you can see from roughly around about 10, 11 P to well, tripled. Yeah. But actually it's still, they only trade on, and this is very conservative estimates. They only trade on, uh, what is it? Roughly around about 1.6 times sales now. And that, that sales is based on 11 and just over 11 million from sure capital. 
And I just think they're going to blow. I mean, if you're looking for a stock that is actually going to blow through estimates, then this is the one because it did 6 million of turnover in the second half of 2023. It's currently forecast by its broker, its estimates to do um, 11.3 million of turnover in the in the whole of this year. So that's that's assuming sales contract, which I just don't believe. <laughs> mm-hmm. When it's when it when when it doubled its sales last year, it more you know we went from uh, sort of like you know uh, it was about four or five million to to eleven to to nine 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 point six million last year. So it's on a real momentum, and it's got these regulatory. So it's a it's a higher. Clearly, it's there's a lot of you know it's it's, it's re-rated, but I think there's still a long way to go. And again, it's something to stick on the stock watch list because. You know, you look at it over a five-year view, and it's still, you know, it re- when it started at about fifty p, so there's still quite a long way to go. But um, I don't know if you've ever, you've, I know Paul had bought this one, didn't he, at one stage, and then wanted to put it into Plexus, I think. Yeah, I suppose the difficulty I have, Paul, is that there's, as you, you know, we were just talking talking about our Gentex. Yeah. Um, I do find it difficult to understand um, what differentiates these. Companies mm. like Cornerstone say they have a proprietary technology, but I mean, what does this really mean? They have, I mean, they say they have multi currency accounts, but a lot of people have multi, you know, a lot of companies provide yes. multi currency accounts. Um, so I'm not sure what what is the the USP there. Like if I could if I could buy into a a, a little a fintech, I, I'd mm. buy into Revolut probably. Um, corner these cornerstone i i just don't know what i don't know yeah. what sets them apart from the great, competition great question i mean cornerstone and our gentex and also equals service the b2b side so what they have mm-hmm. is basically a treasury management it's like an ounce so let's just put yourself into the into the boots of a treasurer for let's just say i don't know you know gkn or unilever or something like that <laughs> then you didn't want to you didn't want to you didn't want to um employ some really expensive head office guys to be able to do all your forex buying and all your forex selling you just wanted somebody to be able to you know say right okay we would need this amount of currency at this time to pay our suppliers or to pay our employees around the world we'll get somebody else to do the forward deals and obviously to buy out you know on the futures contracts for us this is what this is it's effectively it's an outsourcing business because they do all the heavy lifting for corporates to save them costs not only do they don't have to have the expertise, which then builds in that moat into the business because they become dependent on you because you have that relationship um, with with the mm-hmm. person, but also they're cheap, much cheaper than their existing bank. So when they're using like you know a, a Barclays or an HSBC, the the price is a lot is 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 is, is clearly you know better and. They have that locked in relationship with the corporate or with the high net worth individual. So when it comes down to what's the differentiation, that is essentially it. It's B2B. It's building in the customer relationship and then bolting on the software and the expertise to be able to not only give them a better transaction rate, but to but more importantly, to get them a, a good rate and to be able to do you know, large, they might do, let's just say, for instance, a Unilever wants to do a, an acquisition of somebody. Unilever is probably a big, too big a business, but, you know, they wanted to buy, I'm, I'm just guessing here, 100 million of euros, you know, to, to be able to pay for an acquisition six months time. These guys would do it for them. Right. Well, yeah. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah. It, it does astonish me that the the big, you know, the high street banks seem to be asleep at the wheel or, you know they're they're making so much money from the people who don't switch and don't look for alternatives <laughs> that they they don't care uh, you know about the few people who seem who do leave them and go and find the alternative solution so yeah that is interesting thank well i i've been i've been using i, I was a i was a customer i'm in you know of hsbc and i am shocked how poor their customer services on the wealth management but their technical systems are atrocious and, and it's just is sort of like I don't know what's happening. I think the I actually think across the whole banking landscape, the morale is is awful because they've just got rid of so so let so many people and they've got so many silos of historical legacy systems they haven't been able to bring together. It just made it so difficult. I just I, I don't know. The culture just doesn't seem right to me in, in terms of bringing competing. But uh, anyway, yeah. such is life. But I think you've just you've just got to look at what you look at what the numbers are, and when you get a company growing by a hundred percent turnover. Is it really going to contract the following year? 
Oh no, I, that sounds. It sounds like uh, brokers need to uh, maybe uh, update their forecasts there yeah. on that one. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, let's move to another one um, in the sort of the broker area, which is one you covered, I think, yesterday. Jarvis Securities, which mm. is um, sort of like a, again a boutiquey uh, bank that came out with, um, I think, it was a dividend or something, and uh, the shares the shares shot up. So, but it looks cheap anyway. So, what's your latest on this one? Yeah, I see it's up again today. In fact, um, well, is it? Up, You've been yeah. buying, haven't you? That's what no, it is. No, no, I, I, I'm a. I'm a former shareholder here. I, I understand this company uh, reasonably well, I'd say. Um, it's kind of like the Ryanair of uh, of your stockbrokers. Um, that looks... <laughs> that's gone just vertical, hasn't it? Yeah. So the problem is they, um, they've they had some, some regulatory issues and, uh, you know, the FCA has taken an interest and there's going to be a, a review or a report from a you know from a, one of these so-called skilled person reviews uh will be going to the FCA by the end of the month um do, do, do they employ skilled people at the FCA <laughs> I think this, well, the skilled person is a consultant I believe. oh is that okay <laughs> yeah, yeah so um now they they cancelled their Q4 dividend last year last year at the end of 2023 um and it was all very odd because they at the time they cancelled their dividend, they said, "Well, our full year dividend is still as expected, because the you know the brokers had had penciled in a full year dividend of you know a certain amount, which you know assumed that the Q4 dividend would be cancelled. Anyway, it's very strange. But a lot of shareholders then were worried about the Q1 dividend, and they thought, "This is it now." They're going to they're going to tell us that there's no Q1 dividend, mm. and then there's going to be bad news from the skilled person review, and the whole thing is going, going to go to pot. But um, they they are paying a Q1 dividend, uh, 1.75p. That was announced yesterday, and um, brokers actually had uh, they had a 9p full year dividend for 2024 forecast. Wow! Uh, they've shaded that down slightly to 8p. Um, but I think, so it's still on a monster yield. Well, look, shareholders, I think, should be delighted with anything uh, non-zero. And probably what I said yesterday was, you know, they should be targeting at least 7p and up to 9p, you know, which was the original broker forecast mm. uh, could still be possible. Um, and if they're paying that dividend, I suppose the reason everybody's uh, been piling into the shares over the last uh, 48 hours is um, you would kind of hope that this, that the the situation with the FCA um, is um, is sort of not as damning or horrific as uh, you know as it might have been, and that they they'll pull through. So um, do you know what this is about? I mean, it's it's just trying to actually quantify this, give the magnitude of it. I mean, do we know? Have we got any suspicion of what this review is or or, or investigation? I mean, is it is it how big is it and how long is it? Is I mean, what are we talking about? Yeah, so it's it's basically they've got this. Um, they've got a B to C uh, section, and then they've got this. Um, this other section where they provide kind of white label um, services yep. to, to brokers. Um, and the problem is they've not been doing the, uh, well, they, they may not have been following all the rules associated with that. Like alleged, alleged money Possibly. laundering by people, that sort of stuff. They may not have been doing the know your customer checks, something like that. Or... It's, I mean, I mean, I, I, I feel like I need to be careful what I say. Yeah, yeah, no, some, no, no, no. It's all speculation. It, nobody it, knows. Nobody knows, you know, but there may be an issue where they didn't, they didn't, you know, do, do all the checks that they, okay. that they should have done on yeah, that, okay. on the B2B side. So, so that's, okay. that's what it's about. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Well, let's move on to another one, which. It's, it's got a bit of a debt burden. It's one um, I'm going to put onto the stock watch list for future. It's called Maintel Holdings. Again, it's trading at ridiculously cheap valuation. I think it's on about seven times PE. Uh, what is it? Um, yeah, 7.1 times PE. Um, it's not yet paying a dividend, but hopefully will 
sort of like, you know, return to the dividend, dividend level. Let me just get the chart. What it basically does is an outsourced, um, does buy, build, and design of, sorry, d- d- design, uh, build, and operate of sort of communication services. So your web, your broadband for businesses around the UK and also for the sort of public sector. And it has, acts as the first line sort of support. So the network operating center. So let's just take an example. If they've got a sort of hospital that has an employee staff count, say 500 people, then they will outsource the, the running of their broadband and internet communications to these guys who will act as the help desk as the first line support and will actually manage all those seats. So they the, the benefit to the customer is that they then pass the costs all obviously over to, you know, they have a lower level of cost. They have them going to manage it, et cetera. And that's what main, you know, main tell do. And they've been growing that they've had, a, they've slipped up a few, you know, of reading the term, they've got a new management team, a new um, chairman on board. And it's been sort of like pretty much discarded as a, as a share for the last two or three years. The reason why it, it sort of piqued my interest was that Christopher Mills owns quite a few shares and he's been sort of talking about it. And as you can see, they've start, they've bottomed and they've started to, to improve, but there's still a long way to go. 75% of the turnover is recurring revenues. And, um, you know, once you get the economies of scale, once you get sort of like locked into a customer, it's like anything, isn't it? You know, not your software system. You ne- you just don't want to sort of like lift and shift somebody else in because the amount of disruption. So the switching costs are really, you know, sort of like, you know, big. And therefore, you've got just adding extra turnover each year to a recurring revenue base. Now, the only sort of like thing they've been doing over the last two years about to do, they, they because they, they bought an acquisition, and they probably didn't integrate it as well two or three years ago. Then they've got a bit of debt. It's about eighteen million, which is about I think it's just it's less than two times EBITDA. But it's it, again, it's not a one. It's in the stock that's going to shoot the lights out. But actually, there's still quite a lot of recovery. And I'll just give you my sort of valuation of it. I think I, if you did it on a sort of ten times PE, which isn't exactly very expensive, I think you get to about three thirty. And I think the broker's on about four quid. But um, it's 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 again it's a sort of like a bit like a water intelligence kind of business. They just you just keep adding on new customers, but it's a competitive industry clearly. Mm-hmm. And so they've been loss making, and and that's led to management leaving, I presume, and a, a change of a strategy. They seem to be talking about that. It, it's been a turnaround strategy. They've, what they've been doing is rather than actually just doing generic communications. They've been putting in more sort of like, you know, tailored and niche things. So special things like, you know, they'll put cybersecurity on board. They'll do, you know, any specific design and tailorization to the customer. So let's just say, for instance, a hospital is going to be absolutely red hot on um, on data security, patient data security or employee data security, or even because the NHS was attacked, wasn't it, by a virus, you know, sort of two years ago. There'll be a few things. So they tailor it to the actual customer and bring that in. And then they they run off the rails of a lot of the, the sort of major sort of like, you know, um, IT equipment and uh, and software supplies. So people like uh, Cisco and Avaya and people like that. So they act as essentially, the, the, the main tell act as the first line support. But if there's a real technical issue, there's sort of bug fix, et cetera, second line and third line, then they go, that then their help desk will manage and their tech line will manage that that bug fix through the the um, the, the, the technology guys, you know, to, to, to fix it off for their particular customer. Um, so it's, it's, it's the reason why I raise it. It's, it's, it's come off a lot. There's a long way to go. It's still only 34 million market cap. And I think the, you know, the, the, this, the new exec chairman, um, a lady called Carol, um, Thompson seems to be doing a good job to get this business up and rolling because they had a positive trading update, which was, you know, just before Christmas. And you can see the shares, you can see them just ticking Mm -hmm. up and I mean, they've, you know, from their lows, they've more than doubled. Um, and I think that strategy is now working through. It was sort of like profit warning, you know, what's this business doing sort of stuff. And then, you know, Christopher starts picking up shares. Other people start realizing this is still too cheap and it's on about seven times multiple. But with the point is it's, it can actually pay down that debt because it's cash generative and has got, um, you know, sort of like uh, such high recurring revenues. I suppose the the debt is, is about half the market cap still. So that's... Yeah. 
I suppose you do need to take that into account. Hope, um, yeah, into the valuation. If you do it you on know, a, if you get an EV, it's probably 10, 10 times EV already, is it? Ten if you times. do it on an EBIT margin, so not an e, yeah. not an EBITDA margin, if you do it on an, e, an EBIT margin, you still only get 8.3 times. And these okay. things, you know, the things like a lot of these companies get taken out on sort of 14, 15 times, you know, multiple. So you can see how for a private, you know, if you, if you had a roll up, private equity roll up, they would in the private markets, they would strip out everything below gross margin because they would just push it into another business. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Certainly, it looks as if um, if they got a, a solid year or two under their belt, the, yeah. there'd be a good scope for re rating there. Well, uh, the problem is, is that when it, they have two years underneath their belt, that you, the shares will have already gone. That's the that's the problem with the markets. They they beat you to it, don't they? They sort of run uh, they run ahead of things. Okay, the last one that was again a bit of a turnaround. Gone through is uh, is is watches of Switzerland that I know you had a look at, and they had a bit of a bloodbath. It was a it's a favourite of. Uh, Cotney Rebel, Richard Crow, isn't it? On uh, who's uh, who used to love it, but uh, don't want to, a few words on that. Is there is there a buying opportunity here, or is it still sort of like keep keep well away from expensive watches? Yeah, I, I I'm sort of in dangerous territory here because um, you know when you start to think that something looks cheap, but then you also know that there's uh, <laughs> yes, there's I a do. few issues with it. There's um, you know there's some potentially serious issues. Um, you know, when I was reading about this one, I, I started to think, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be great to, if I, if we could buy shares in Rolex? And I, uh, it, it took me about 30 seconds to realize that, um, that that's owned by a private foundation. So mm. uh, not possible. So we're left with watches of Switzerland, which is kind of the, the poor man's Rolex. Rolex. Um, so they've got a, a couple of issues. The watch market has been of interest to me as well because I follow the pawnbrokers very closely. Yeah. And, um, you know, they've been reporting issues with watches. Um, so, I mean, my, my, our, our mutual friend, Paul Scott, he sort of thinks that, that watches are, um, uh, you know, so are in some kind of a fad. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I agree. But what, what do you wear? What watch do you wear? Believe it or not, I don't wear a watch. Oh, okay, yeah. No, yeah. I've been wanting to watch for some time, but if I, if I did, it'd be a Casio job. Casio. <laughs> but, but no, you, what, what you raise is a really good point. In, first of all, in terms of read across from other areas, because you, as you say, you track the um, uh, the Ramsdens and the H&Ts, and when you see them talking about watch sales, then you're right. Then you can really get a lens into these kind of guys as well can't you so oh, what, what what if you've seen if you did you see softness in ramsden's and therefore you saw or was it in and then you sort of like went into you know you had to put the read across into watches of switzerland you know it's actually uh h and t um they they they're very good at, in watches because they they actually bought a company that services watches to bring mm. that in-house um and so they've got all the expertise. They've got incredible technology for studying watches and figuring out what's wrong with them and so on. But in terms of the retailing trends, they've actually reduced their exposure to watches. Yeah. Um, they found that um, in terms of lending on watches became less attractive and, and retailing watches, I think, also became, became more difficult. Um, so obviously, when this a perfect read across to watches of Switzerland, mm. um, where they're actually seeing revenue down, you know, falling. Yeah. Uh, so, so their Q3 update uh, saw saw revenue falling. Strangely, though, watches was, didn't seem to be the worst part of it. They were talking about other jewelry as what well, being being really weak. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, you know mm. how what to make of that exactly, but basically, um, they they're they're struggling, especially in the UK. Um, yeah. Again, we were talking earlier about the US versus UK. US revenue is actually up, um, and and they're growing market share over there in the UK and in Europe. Revenues were down five percent. Mm. Um, so there, I mean, there's a lot, couple of issues there. The VAT free shopping um, has been a, an issue for them. They're, yeah, you know that's something. I studied the casinos as well, um, you know, uh, Rank Group, uh, who own Grover yeah. Casinos. They were saying that there's that there's an issue in terms of high net worth visitors to the UK. Same thing here with Watches of Switzerland. 
saying that um, you know VAT free shopping, mm -hmm. the the lack of it is, is a problem. So now I I am kind of optimistic that that could come back. Um, there's been a few ru rumors and reports that VAT free shopping could come back, and that would be a huge boost. Um, so that could that could help to improve things. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, I'm kind of I'm tempted by watches of Switzerland on yeah. a, you know, in terms of valuation, it is, um, you know, it's trading it's cheap, isn't it? It's on a nine times PE with cash on the balance sheet. It, it looks, it looks like, to me, it looks like a bit of a value trap actually, because what you've just said to me is they're expecting sales to soften. You know, we've seen that through the others and actually their April 25 numbers are for an increase in sales with a, a rising operating margin, which looks, you know, it's plausible, but it looks in this circumstances, you've got to put a question mark where they're going to have another profit warning here. Yeah. I, look, I'm not mentioning this as a share that I'm like particularly positive on at all. Um, it, I agree with you entirely. It's 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 looking quite risky, mm. but it, it is it's kind of that annoying point where you, you look at the yeah. PE multiple and you think, hmm, it's starting to look cheap. And that's so yeah. so dangerous um, in terms of the debt. You're You're right that they're. You know they've got um, you know a decent balance sheet, yeah. Um, but uh, a classic retailer uh, value trap is the leases. You know the leases used yes. to be off balance sheet. Uh, mm. These have the best part of half a billion pounds of lease liabilities on their balance sheet under the current accounting rules, um, and so the, you know these are very expensive, prop you know properties in prime locations. Yeah. So. Um, I'm not. I'm not particularly positive on this one, but I do think it's a, it's an interesting one to keep an eye on, and there's read across to other companies from it as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. We've got a few questions coming in. So I know we've talked about that. We've got um, Matthew Roberts saying thoughts on Card Factory selling of uh, Telos holding this down and uh, seems very good value. He asks as if you're familiar. I think this is a, a Paul Scott type stop. But um, any views on on, on Card Factory? Again, I, I sort of put it in that retail value trap category, um, highly commoditized, but probably probably cheap, probably value. Um, it's not something that I'd be buying myself. I'm not sure if you've got a view. Uh, yeah, it isn't. Card factory to me, the business model, to be brutal, is uh, doesn't it doesn't fit the sort of like the the high um, IPR type stuff, recurring revenue streams, secular growth. It just didn't. I know it's cheap, but I try and avoid those type of stocks because I, I I do find I scratch my head in terms of really looking at their you know barriers to enter. I I, I would look who would want to buy it, you know, and and if and if there's a, an optionality when it comes to a share that a private equity guy or a or a, another trademark trade buyer would would pick it up, then um, then I would do. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not mine. Um, another one from um, uh, Lemon Physical <laughs> says, "Welcome on board, uh, Graham. It is great to have you on the show. So uh, you've got a few fans there already. Well, thank you, Lemon Physical. <laughs> um, if anybody wants um, to ask any more questions, sorry about that. I was a bit late on uh, asking them, but just please put your uh, questions on the um, in the board, and um, then I will um, I will ask Graham um, about those." It just turning now to sort of have you been selling anything in your portfolio have you, over the last few weeks? Have you been sort of trimming or anything you've been lightening up? And also, what's your sort of your, your sort of you know holding uh, period, you know, length of time typically, and also your, your number, your cash holding level? Uh, yeah, so I'm just fully invested, and um, I don't talk about my personal portfolio all that much because I would never sort of recommend anybody to do it. Um, I have 50% uh, in my top two holdings. I have 90% in my top six holdings. And I just uh, hold these things until there's some kind of uh, event. <laughs> where I take oh, okay. Over well, what do you just, 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 just give me, what, what are your two biggest holdings anyway? Uh, yeah. So I'm kind of locked into Valvery. Um, uh, this is a, a bit of a sensitive one because the, the, the the founder and the, the chief executive uh, very tragically died last year. He's a young man, and mm. uh, uh, so his brother is now running the company. And it's um, we're, I'm just sort of waiting to to get some kind of a, an update there in terms of 
future yeah. plans. Um, what's the ticker that... on? What's the ticker on Volvery? Uh, VLE. VLE. Yeah, so I, I, it's very illiquid. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, yeah, got you. And uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I don't talk about it very much. I'm just waiting for them to 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 decide what they're going to do next now, okay. now that they lost the founder. Um, okay. And what's the other one? Uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you've got one higher risk and one sort of like rock solid. Uh, and then my other stuff, uh, you know, I've had a really tough year with Burberry. Um, Burberry's oh, down, yeah. Burberry's down a lot. Um, uh, but on the other hand, I've had a great year with Alphabet. Uh, Alphabet's up 50%. Um, I hold IG Group. That's been a long-term holding for me. And mm. that's why I like talking about CMC as well. Yeah. As we discussed before, probably wish i owned cmc uh, as well um you can't own everything that's the thing about being a stock the picker problem. and then uh, i do own next as well um and i've been a long-term holder of next <clears throat> so i would like to recycle and you know move th- move into a few other stuff but um those are my top six holdings if if there's some kind of uh, movement in in Bavary, then uh I'll probably recycle that into into some more stuff, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I kind of hold this stuff for for years and years. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just let. I mean, I I've actually like I was fully loaded into the stock market about two weeks ago, but I wanted to buy Argentex, so I've sort of like sold a, a couple and also just built. I had to pay for um, a new kitchen and some landscaping and tax bills and all this sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. I've um, I've come out of RWS, which is a language translation business, and also. TPI cap I sold, which is a bit like your um, IG index, but um, at a, a, over OTC securities it does, um, yes. and uh, and GB Group as well. But GB Group had it was got to, it, it keeps going up, and so people think momentum, which is fine. I just I just don't understand momentum, and uh, it, I just wanted to, I just took a profit. It was on 20, 22 times PE, and I thought, okay, well, I'll recycle it into something like six or seven times. So uh, Lovely, I thought yeah. I thought I'd let people know, but my. Uh, I think I've got about 15, 15% um, cash now. Now you've got another question here, Graham. Um, no, it's from uh, Lemon Physical again. He's the guy who said, uh, welcome on board. He says, any thoughts on gaming rain, uh, realms? Which I think is something that uh, Paul has talked about, which does software. Slingo Bingo, is it? Is the is the thing that they do? I don't know what the valuation is, but um, they, they I think they supply it as a mobile game and as an online game into other online casinos and get a royalty off the back of it. Gaming realms, yeah, I've I've not covered this one. I'm very sorry to say. Uh, have you got a view on it, Paul? Um, I don't know. I'm just going to sort of get it <laughs> yeah, up. Let me no, just, uh... I, I, I've not covered. I, I mean, um, I'll be curious. I, I, I'm familiar with the ticker, um, yeah. but I don't believe that I've studied it. Let me just. Uh... Here it is, Gaming Realms. That 15 times PE, it has been uh, profitable for the last couple of years. Yeah. And it's been listed. Oh, it looks like there's been... Uh... Okay, so it's 108 million market cap. Seems to have a so- solid balance sheet, not too much, but a bit of cash on the balance sheet. And wow, it's a rocket ship. <laughs> mm. Look at the financials on this one. Yeah. Okay, so my, my, my take on it is it's got to hit those numbers. So there's quite a lot of good news already in there, but... If it is a licensing model and it's dropping down, then you'll see, look at the, yeah, there you go. There you go. The operating mar- margins are absolutely taking off because you can see all the, the um, you know, the operational gearing. Um, it comes down to really, do you believe in the Slingo Bingo band? That would be, would be mine. And if you do, and they can expand faster than that top line, then the shares are going to continue going up, I'd say. Um, on terms of valuation, the PEs here don't really work very well because they use reported rather than, oh, look at the, yeah, that's on reported numbers. That's not on adjusted. Yeah, right. I mean, 15 times reported PE is pretty cheap. On an EBITDA, seven times, I'd say because it's in gambling, then you're going to get a discount. But um, that doesn't look expensive, even though the chart, let's have a look at the chart. The chart, oh, okay. It's been pretty. It's been well. It's one way, one way up, isn't it? The fact over the last year. Let's look over five years. Okay, well, well done, uh, Lemon Physical. I think you probably made quite a bit of money if you bought around about five p, and it's the thirty six. <laughs> mm. I mean, you're you're a bit of a chart expert, aren't you? I mean, how, what would you say for the chart on that? That's the fifty day moving average, and I'll get the. Um, let me get the. Uh, there's the two hundred mark. I mean, it's it's above the two hundred day. I mean, frankly, not much. So, looks looks pretty much intact to me. But you're the expert there, Graham. 
<laughs> we do chart of the day, Paul. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you have to chart of the day. You're right, brilliant. Yeah, we'll do chart of the day. Uh, yeah, higher lo- higher highs, higher lows, but uh, but possibly needs to to break uh, psychological resistance of forty. Okay, good. All right, well, brilliant. Okay, well, I think we'll close it there. We've done a, a great hour, and uh, thanks very much again, uh, Graham. We've run through some excellent stocks that people can have a look for, and uh, you know, I, um, uh, I, I guess in the next uh, two weeks, anything which is going to sort of pique your interest. I've got, I think we've got the UK banks reporting, haven't we? NatWest came out with something this morning. I haven't seen it, but um, they've got all this. Um, the, the the motor car insurance thing to uh, to to report out and to provide for i guess as well yeah i mean a lot of i suppose the uh, the fca is sort of front and center at the minute with all, with this uh, review into mm. into motor commissions um so personally i'm quite curious to see what the outcome is there and um the fca also uh seeming to uh, want brokers to pass on interest to customers in a high rate environment. Uh, that's one of the things that Jarvis might be involved with. Um, yeah. There might be pressure to do that. So I'm kind of hoping to get some some uh, news on both of those FCA related topics uh, pretty soon. Yeah, that's the consumer duty thing, isn't it? Which has hit a lot of the, it did the um, AJ Bell and um, Hargreaves Lansdowne hit them hard, didn't it? Oh no, in fact it hits, was it um, St James's place massively? Don't didn't it six months ago? Yeah, and I should mention I do own a, a, a small slug of shares in Hargreaves Lansdowne. So uh, yeah, I'm quite curious to see how that one pans out. Okay, well next next time I'll uh, I'll, I'll pick your brains on Hargreaves Lansdowne because I know that's a popular share that uh, it's either a, it's either a value play or a value trap. Mm. So we'll find out. So uh, thanks again, uh, Graham, and uh, look forward to chatting in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks so much, Paul. It's been a pleasure.